It's alleged some grocery suppliers are being bullied and face the threat of having their products deleted from supermarket shelves if they speak out about the tactics used by some big players, according to a supplier industry group. The Food and Grocery Council represents suppliers and it welcomes the government-ordered study, but also wants a mandatory industry code of conduct to curb what it calls the egregious behaviour of rogues. The council's CEO, Catherine Rich, says some suppliers are being Build for in-store thefts and are unfairly forced to bid for shelf space in auctions. In order to get your product on the shelf today, um, you have to offer supermarkets a gross margin of anywhere between 30 and 45% just to get on the shelf. And then there will be additional costs to promote, shelf costs, merchandising costs, there'll be additional claims, rebates, you know, any opportunity to to get more income out of you, um, the, the list is endless. So, and so are suppliers being held to ransom here? I believe that most have little or no negotiation power, so it's not they're held to ransom, it's that they're forced to be in a position of, of being a price taker. It's, it's like, take this on board or don't supply us or have your product deleted. And that's one thing that is also ruled out by the code. You can't just use deletion as a threat. You have to have commercial grounds rather than saying, I don't like that you're complaining to me, I'm going to delete your product. Or if you don't pay this, I'm going to delete your product. Deletion is usually the, the, the default <laughs> tactic. So by deletion, you mean get tossed off the shelf in the supermarket, you're gone? Yeah. And that is very, very serious because in a system, in a, in a market structure where there are two main supermarket teams, if you get kicked off the shelf, you can lose anywhere between 45% and 55% of your sales. And for some New Zealand companies, that is the difference between surviving or shutting down their factories. And that is why I think we've seen so much manufacturing move offshore and we're more reliant on imports. So how often is robust negotiation crossing the line into bullying on the part of the supermarket? I would say that um, most maintain a healthy culture, but at the store level, we do have some buyers and some store owners who clearly never got the memo and just make demands which uh, are well beyond robust negotiation. But of course, no one can complain for fear of being deleted. And that's why if, if you ever try and get a grocery supplier to come on your show to discuss things, you won't find anybody who's prepared to speak because the fear of retribution is very, very genuine. So, well, how then are we going to find out what goes on behind the scenes if that fear is so strong? There's an, um, uh, there's an investigation, a review. So how are we going to get them to speak up, honestly? Well, the Commerce Commission is very aware that it is a market environment where most suppliers are not or do not feel at liberty to speak or are fearful of retribution. So that is why in the last time... Commerce Commission did a, an investigation of sorts. Uh, they provided absolute confidentiality. But certainly the Food and Grocery Council will be providing anonymised scenarios which are based on the sorts of behaviour that we have seen. Um, but it's certainly something the Commerce Commission is aware of this. It's a, in, a, in this market environment, it is hard to speak out because you could lose your space on the shelf. So, so are customers getting ripped off and how do we exercise choice when there's two main suppliers? Well, I'm very confident that the wholesale prices from uh, New Zealand food and grocery manufacturers are fair and reasonable because the fat's been trimmed from companies years ago through these negotiations. But margins do remain high in New Zealand. In fact, some industry commentators will say that New Zealand and Australia have the most profitable supermarkets in the developed world. And that's because they have very, very high margins, the difference, the difference between revenue and the cost of goods. And some will say there is competition. Actually, no, there's not, if you think about where you get your laundry powder and, and um, other grocery items. Uh, so when you have that privileged position of a of a market duopoly or duopsony, you have to have additional accountabilities and responsibilities. And that's what a study will look at and that's what we think a code will deliver. So Catherine, are you saying that it is the supermarkets that are creaming it while the suppliers keep getting squeezed and the consumers are having to dig deep into their pockets, but it's not your people that are getting the money? 
I'm saying that we have many food and grocery manufacturers who have either gone out of business or had to sh um, shut down or move their move their product um, offshore for development because you just can't make a normal profit. Um, so who is making the profit then, Catherine? Spell it out for us. Who's getting the goodies? As I've said, it, supermarkets in New Zealand are the most profitable in the world. They have the most highly concentrated market in the world. But that said, uh, I can't say it's absolutely just the supermarkets because there are some factors in the New Zealand market that are important. We're one of the few countries in the world that puts GST on food and groceries, unlike most countries. We are at the bottom of the world and it's expensive to freight down here. We have a market size, um, the geog geography size of Japan and a very small market the size of Sydney. So it is complex, but it's all these things that a market study will look at. You um, would like a code of conduct, like Australia, right? But the, but the code in Australia is voluntary. So, I mean, is that really going to solve our problems? I, I, we, we would like it to be mandated and overseen by the Commerce Commission. It won't solve all the problems. Supplying the grocery market is never for the faint-hearted, for all those out there want, dreaming the big dream and wanting to set up their own food companies, but it will make a difference. Overnight, it did rule out some of the more egregious behaviour that was seen in both Australia and the UK. Things like forcing suppliers to pay for theft in store, which is um, completely a retail cost. Forcing supply, um, making arbitrary deductions from payments just because you can. You know, it, it will bring a level of professionalism back to those stores who are the problem, the minority of stores. Catherine, so I'm understanding this correctly. Are you saying if someone um, shoplifts from a supermarket and the product goes walkabout, that the uh, supplier of that product is being asked to pay for what's been stolen? Uh, yes, in some circumstances. And I'll give you one example. One store did um, check their inventory, did a stock take, they looked at what they had on shelf minus their sales and obviously what they'd lost, and they billed the supplier to pay the difference. Now, I would say retail theft and a whole bunch of other costs that are genuine retail costs should sit with the retailer. It is unfair to keep shifting the costs back to suppliers to pay as some kind of arbitrary new cost. So you're talking about people being too scared to speak out because they could be bullied, their product could be, as you put it, deleted, and they're being charged for thefts that they haven't, uh, well, they're not responsible for in any way, shape or form. You're talking, wow, sounding like the grocery mafia here, isn't it, Catherine? It's certainly a business culture that has to change. And some store owners do a very good job but there are some out there who clearly have not got the memo and are getting away with it. And every time we try and um, raise it, certainly with the independent stores, the owner operators, um, people will say, oh, it's their business, they can do what they like. But I always think um, sunlight is the best disinfectant, and that's why I've been talking openly about the type of behaviour, because certainly when it comes to the treatment of merchandisers, the mostly women who go into those stores at ungodly hours to stack shelves, they deserve to be treated better and to to work within a better grocery culture. And that's what we're hoping for as a result of this market study and with, uh, hopefully, uh, it leading to a grocery code of conduct because it will make a difference. won't solve everything, but it will make a difference. So while you say that generally, well, people play by the rules, but some aren't, how do you describe the ones who aren't playing by the rules? I call them rogues. Um, in some cases, I think that they are um, store owners who actually wear this kind of uh, uh, um, behaviours of this kind of um, culture should be seen as a, a badge of honour. And it's look, part of it wasn't even acceptable last century and it's certainly not acceptable in 2020. And those are the stores that we're, we are going to lobby hard to get to change their practices. Are you describing bullies? Yes, I am. And in many cases, it is. It, there's no other word for it. Um, um, you know, we've had, there are some stores um, in the Auckland area where our members will not send a rep and not send a merchandiser because they think the environment is harmful to their mental health. Now, what does that tell you? And that was Catherine Rich from the Food and Grocery Council.